Good morning. Today we're continuing our series looking at the life of King David. But this week, things take something of a downward turn. David, God's anointed king. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the giant slayer. David, who until this point has been mostly described in a positive light, gives in to temptation. And he makes some very big mistakes as one sin leads to another. I wonder what you think of when you hear the word temptation. It can be defined as the wish to do or have something that you know you should not do or have. Or as something that makes you want to do or have something that you know you should not. Interestingly, when I searched for images of temptation on Google, most of the first ones that came up were for an apple clearly linking back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when temptation and sin first entered the world, when Eve was tempted by the serpent to eat from the tree God had told them not to eat from. There were also images of a person with a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, some of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, and there were a few images of food. Now, one of the things that came to my mind when I was thinking about this was Michael Rosen's wonderful poem, Chocolate Cake. For me, this captures something of the essence of temptation and how one step leads to another, but in a delightfully light-hearted way. If you've never come across this poem, then do look it up. It's brilliant. It's about a young boy who wakes up in the night thinking of chocolate cake and he creeps downstairs to secretly eat just a little bit, just a few crumbs. But before he knows it, he's eaten the whole cake. So he tries to hide the fat by washing up the plate and putting it away. Not surprisingly, the boy's mum did notice in the morning. He got found out despite washing up the plate, putting it away, trying to hide the evidence. Because as we all see in David's story, the things we don't do, which we know we shouldn't generally, we shouldn't generally get found out sooner or later, even if we try to hide them and cover them up. And even if they don't get found out by others, God still sees them, as he did in David's case. Now, there are obviously vastly varying degrees of temptation. Eating a chocolate cake, even a whole one in the middle of the night, clearly isn't on the same level as what David does in the story we're looking at today. But temptation is something that as humans, I think we all struggle with in one form or another. Whether that be the more obvious things like sex, money, pride, envy, lust, power or addiction, or whether it be the less obvious, more subtle things. Interestingly, in one recent survey, admittedly of Americans, the top five self-reported temptations were anxiety or worry, procrastination, eating too much, overuse of electronics and social media, and laziness. But whatever the temptation we struggle with, it's how we deal with it that's important. The episode in David's life, which we're focusing on today, as described in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, is one of two halves. David's spiralling sins and his journey away from God as he struggles to deal with the consequences of initially giving in to temptation, followed by David's repentance and his journey back to God. We're going to explore what we can learn from David's mistakes, from his weaknesses and failings, from his humanity. How can we respond to temptation differently? What might help us to withstand it? And if we do mess up and give in to temptation as David did, what should we do then? How can our relationship with God and others be restored? Now, first of all, in today's story, in David's journey away from God and into temptation, we discover that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. If we read verse one, we learn that in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now part of the job description of being a king in David's day was to lead his people into battle. As we read back in 1 Samuel chapter eight, verse 20, the people wanted a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Yet here is David, the giant slayer, David, the great military leader, 
choosing to stay at home in Jerusalem and send one of his commanders out to lead the army instead of doing so himself. We're not told why David chose to stay, but in doing so, David was neglecting his duty as king. He was ceasing to be the king the people wanted and needed, the king that God had anointed him to be. And as a result, he was left in Jerusalem, seemingly with a dangerous amount of free time on his hands. He clearly hadn't stayed because he was overwhelmed by the duties of government. Worryingly, it seems that what led David to take his first step towards temptation and sin was simply doing nothing. Simply doing nothing. He wasn't serving his people in the way he should. He wasn't fulfilling his God-given purpose. And so he ended up at a loose end, possibly somewhat discontented and so vulnerable and open to temptation. How often might that be true for us? How much more likely are we to give in to temptation if we're in the wrong place at the wrong time, whatever that might mean for us? Whether we find ourselves gossiping at work or spending time with the wrong crowd of friends, going to places where we know we will struggle to resist temptation, or whether we find ourselves alone at home with our phone or sat in front of the computer, one click away from a pornographic website, or home alone with a bottle of wine, when we know that's not a good place for us to be. Where are those dangerous places for us which we need to seek to avoid being in? Are there any places we know we've allowed ourselves to be in or to go to on a regular basis where we know we really shouldn't be? If so, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to seek to avoid these places of temptation? And if we can't avoid them, what are we going to do to equip us to resist the temptations we face in them better? But often there's more to it than simply physically being in the wrong place at the wrong time as David was. Because if we're not in the right place with God in our hearts, if we're not in the right place spiritually, then we're less likely to be able to resist temptation when it does come our way. Why did David choose to remain in Jerusalem rather than go to war? We're not told why in the story, so we can only speculate. But perhaps he'd risen so high and become so powerful and so successful that he'd become too comfortable, too complacent. Had he forgotten that it was God who'd raised him up from shepherd boy to king, that it was God who brought about all his victories? Had so much power and success gone to his head and led him to rely on his own strength and resources rather than God's? Had he perhaps begun to neglect his relationship with God and allowed his heart to grow distant from him? Had his worship life begun to grow cold? Had he lost his hunger for God and allowed his passions to be redirected elsewhere? Had he stopped seeking God and following his leading? What about us? Are we in a right relationship with God at the moment? Do our hearts hunger for more of God and his spirit in our lives? Or are they focused on more earthly passions? If we know we've allowed ourselves to drift from God and begun to neglect our relationship with him, what are we going to do about it? As we'll see with David, God will always welcome us back, no matter far, how far we've wandered, if we turn back to him. So if we read on in the story, we learn that while David is in the wrong place at the wrong time, in his palace in Jerusalem, rather than leading out his troops in battle, when walking around his palace roof one evening, he sees a beautiful woman, washing and rather than averting his gaze he presumably keeps on looking and immediately decides that he wants her rather than fleeing temptation David saw and he wanted what he saw as one author puts it he falls head over heels in lust with her he wanted what he couldn't or shouldn't have and I think it's important to note here that there's nothing in the text to suggest that Bathsheba was deliberately trying to attract David's attention it's likely that she was in her own private courtyard, bathing to cleanse herself after her menstrual period, where she might reasonably expect not to be seen by passers-by or other onlookers. It was David who was on the roof, peering down at Bathsheba. But having seen this beautiful woman, David then sends someone to find out about her. But even when he's told Bathsheba is already married to Uriah the Hutter, Pittite, who, as we learn later, is one of David's soldiers who's out fighting where David too should be. This doesn't put David off. 
and having sent someone to find out about her, David then sends messages to get Bathsheba and to bring her to him so they can have sex together to satisfy David's desires. The text doesn't tell us whether Bathsheba was a willing participant in this or whether David forced her to sleep with him. But we do know that David was the one who sent for her and that women often have very little say in those days as they were generally seen as possessions. Evidenced by the fact that Bathsheba is called by her name only once in this incident, the rest of the time she's simply called the woman. And while it's a more extreme example, you only need to read all the recent headlines concerning the shocking way in which Hamid al Fayed, the former owner of Harrods, treated and abused many of the young women who worked for him over several decades, to see that sadly, in some instances, some men still use their power and status to take advantage of women and then use their position to seek to cover up their wrongdoing. How can Christian men set a better example and show a different way of treating women with godly love, kindness and respect? Why did David treat Bathsheba in this way, rather than averting his eyes when he first caught sight of her? To what extent were his actions here the result of the fact that by having so many wives and concubines, David had already let his standards slip far from God's original intention when he created Adam and Eve for union to be between one man and one woman. In addition to the specific wives mentioned by name elsewhere in 1 and 2 Samuel, we read in 2 Samuel chapter 5, for example, that after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem and more sons and daughters were born to him. Although in having multiple wives and concubines, David was simply doing what everyone expected a ruler in his day to do. Surely this must have increased the likelihood that he would want more women, even those like Bathsheba, he knew he shouldn't have because they were already married. Are there any areas in our lives where we know we're letting our standards slip from the way God calls us to seek to live? Through living by the standards of our secular culture rather than by God's standards? If so, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to seek to live by God's standards again instead? Another factor that's likely to have played its part in David's actions here is his sense of entitlement. He wanted what he couldn't have, but as king, he felt he had the right to take it anyway. What about us? What do we want that we know we can't or shouldn't have? Where do our eyes wander? What do we feel that we are entitled to in some way? Why do we feel entitled to it? What do we think it will give us? What void within us do we hope that it will fill? In what way do we think it will make us happy, for example? For David, the temptation he gave into was sex with anyone he saw and desired, even though he already had multiple wives. As king, he believed this was something he was entitled to. And sadly, adultery is something many people today still think will make them happy. Something which they think they're in some way entitled to if they're unhappy in their marriage. Despite the fact that it rarely does bring lasting happiness and often ends in misery and devastation. Because it's not what God intended for us. For example, a number of years ago now, a website which was set up with the specific intention of helping married people find other married people with which to have a secret affair. The site's tagline was, life is short, have an affair. By 2015, the company had launched in 40 countries and had more than 37 million users. Unfortunately for those people registered with the site, in 2015 it was hacked and the personal details of many of those registered on it were made public, often with devastating consequences for those involved, as their secret life came to light. But it's important to remember here that there is always hope. There is always a way back to God, no matter what we've done or how badly we've messed up. Now, it may well be something different for us that we feel entitled to, that we think will make us happy, that we're tempted by, even when deep down we know it won't really make us happy. Whether that be more money, a nicer house, a promotion at work. In what areas of our lives do we put our own desires first above the needs of others? because we think our lives will be complete if only we have such and such. What are the dangers of living this way? <laughs>
Focusing on what we don't have rather than what we do have leads us to devalue what we already have because it reinforces our belief that it's not enough. It also encourages us to develop a mindset that makes taking what we can't have more likely, as it did in David's case. Now, obviously, not all desires are bad. The key question to ask ourselves in all of this is, does the thing I desire deepen and improve my relationships with God, with others and with myself? Or will it harm or endanger them? The good news is that even if we do come to the conclusion that what we are doing is harming or breaking our relationship, it is never too late to stop, to turn around and walk away, to prioritise relationships that you know are good and positive for you over the things that you feel you must have or are tempted by. It's never too late to stop, to turn around. In our story, David sadly went from being in the wrong place at the wrong time to taking what he couldn't have to then seeking to cover up his sin when his mistakes catch up with him, when Bathsheba sends word to him that she's pregnant. Rather than choosing this moment to own up, David does his best to cover up what he's done by trying to persuade Bathsheba's husband to go home and sleep with her so it looks as if she's pregnant by her own husband who is, of course, away at war. Unfortunately for David, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, is more upstanding in these matters than David is and won't even consider making love to his wife while his men are camped out in the open country. Even when David gets Uriah drunk, he still sticks to his principles. So in his desperate attempt to hide his sin and preserve his reputation, David has to resort to plan B. And shockingly, he arranges to have Uriah, his loyal soldier, killed in battle. Question is, how did David, this man after God's own heart, the writer of so many great psalms of faith, stoop so low? The disturbing thing is that he didn't wake up one morning and think, I'm going to commit adultery today, or I'm going to ensure one of my faithful soldiers is killed today. But one thing led to another. David shouldn't have stayed in Jerusalem when his army was out fighting. He shouldn't have looked twice at Bathsheba. He shouldn't have sent someone to find out about her and then had her brought to the palace. He shouldn't have slept with her. He shouldn't have tried to cover up his sin by trying to trick Uriah. And he shouldn't have arranged to have Uriah killed. At any point in this downward spiral, David could have chosen to act differently. But he didn't. And things went from bad to worse. Now, we might well look at this story and think, that could never happen to me. And yes, that particular set of circumstances is certainly unlikely to happen to us. But we should be wary of thinking we are above embarking on such a downward spiral because it's very easy to give in to temptation and for one, for one seemingly small thing to lead to another and another and another. And before we know it, we may, like David, have reached a point of crisis where our hearts have drifted far from God and our actions have caused potentially devastating damage to ourselves and others. As Tim Chester puts it, nobody decides one day to have an affair, nobody decides one day to steal from their company. But if you neglect your duty, if you gratify your eyes, if you indulge your fantasies, if you fail to flee temptation, then that may be where you end up. Our consciences are our internal, internal alarm systems that God has given to us to stop us from sinning. But as Paul points out in 1 Timothy, if you push past your conscience enough times, then the alarm stops ringing. Or we find it more easy to ignore it. Because our conscience has become hardened or seared as with a hot iron, as Paul puts it. If you are deliberately ignoring your conscience, then please stop ignoring it and allow it to speak to you. And if you're engaging in any secret sins which you're desperate to hide from others, then please ask God to give you the courage to speak to someone you trust and seek help to stop. We all make mistakes. We all make wrong decisions at times. We are all sinners saved by God's amazing grace. None of us are perfect. But what we choose to do when we realise we've messed up 
is what's important. When we try to cover up our mistakes and fail to deal with them, they generally only get worse and cause us more problems as the guilt, shame and fear of being found out gradually eat away at us. And as David was soon to be reminded, God sees it all anyway. At the end of chapter 11, we learn that Uriah is dead. His wife is mourning for him. And then after the time of mourning, David has her brought to his house so she can become his wife and she can bear him their son. Seemingly, David has succeeded in covering up his sin. But, but all is not quite that simple. Because we read in verse 27 that the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. David may have succeeded in covering up his sin before human eyes, but God has seen and God is not pleased. He sends the prophet Nathan to David to expose his wrongdoing by telling him a story, a parable of David's life, of a rich man with lots of sheep who took a poor man's one and only little lamb, which leads David to unknowingly condemn himself with his own words. David has become the kind of king who takes from his people rather than serving them, as he's been anointed to do, because he stopped living under God's power and started to exercise his own instead. Nathan goes on to share God's word with David more directly. We read in 2 Samuel 12 verses 7 to 10. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what's evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Thankfully, God's word to David hits home immediately. David acknowledges and confesses his sin to Nathan, saying, I have sinned against the Lord. He doesn't try to justify or deny his actions. Nor does he try to hide them from Nathan by confessing them quietly to God in the hope that no one else will find out. And that public rather than private act of confession is significant because it would help to keep David accountable to Nathan going forwards. And the same is true for us. If we're caught up in sin and struggling to find a way out, then we need to tell someone, another Christian who we trust, who we can be accountable to, who can help us on our journey towards repentance and freedom, freedom from our sin. As the policeman is once quoted as saying, there are two types of sorry. I'm sorry I got caught and I'm sorry I ever did it. I'm sorry I got caught and I'm sorry I ever did it. And the second type of sorry is the godly sorrow, sorrow that Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians 7 and which David demonstrates here. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow and repentance leads to restoration and salvation because God is a God of grace who offers forgiveness to all who truly repent of their sins. As Nathan tells David in verse 13, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But although God forgives David, and restores him to his service, he doesn't take away the consequences of his actions. And David and Bathsheba's child dies. The innocent child pays the price for David's sin, which seemed terribly unfair. This has been seen by some as a pointer to the cross. David sinned and deserved to die, but someone else died in his place. And that someone was David's innocent son. But one day, the ultimate son born to David's life, Jesus, would die for the sins of the world, for our sins. And David's confession and repentance is something that Phil will be exploring more next week when he looks at Psalm 51, the psalm David is thought to have written after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. This is, in many ways, a tough story for us to read and reflect on and one which will present different challenges to each of us. 
whether we've been affected by someone we know and love giving into temptation, which has been harmful to them and maybe us, or whether there's something we know we have either struggled with in the past or we know we're still struggling with today. And if it has highlighted anything in your own life, which you know you need to act on, then please listen to what God is saying to you and ask him for the courage to talk to someone you trust about it. Don't just ignore it in the hope it will go away, because it won't. I'd like to close with a reminder that Andy Percy gives us in his book on David. He writes, David's choices on the balcony took him away from the best that God had for him, but they did not take him away from God's heart, from God's mercy or from God's grace. And the same is true for us. When we mess up and get things wrong, this may take us away from the best that God has for us, but it cannot take us away from God's mercy, his love and his grace. Amen.